And we said earlier that um, you have the opportunity to ask questions. So I'll come down on the front. And anyone, anyone who has a question, does this work? Is, anyone who has a question, please ask. Who has the first question about what we uh, talked about here this morning? What we preached? And if you raise your hand, wait for the microphone, camera will bring it around. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure what uh, an extortioner and a reviler is. How, how do you discern what, what they are? Uh, what do uh, they do? Yeah, uh, uh, extortioner is a easy, little bit e easier one. Extor an extortioner is a person who uses legal means to steal from his neighbor. Um, a thief, a common thief, is one who uses illegal means. Sneaks into his house and runs off with jewelry <coughs> or money. But that's not the only way to be a, a thief. You might be able to vote that money right out of your neighbor's pocket. That's an extortion. Or you might be able to get some kind of a law passed where anybody who has so much money has to hand it out to their neighbors. Actually, better yet, hand it to the bureaucrats and then let them hand it out to the neighbors. That's a lot, a lot better. Um, the um, railer, if you will, or reviler, perhaps a little bit harder to define. Paul only uses that twice. And we actually read in, in his writings, we actually read the other passage. He uses it in, in uh, chapter 6 as well. And it, it, it's talking about a railer, a person who, it, best I can tell, it's a person who adds nothing to any kind of discussion at all, brings nothing to the table, but can only say that everything is bad and everybody's wicked, and everybody except him needs to, needs to straighten up. It's the closest thing I can come to a mocker in, in Psalm 1. Mockers don't add to anything. They can only revive. And, and it's, to me, it's, it's, it's not that different from those people who are godless, who can't build a civilization, they can only tear down what's been built. And I think that's a representative of the enemy of our souls. Satan can't build anything. He can destroy what's been built, but he can't make anything. And that's what I believe he's talking about, the reviler. The person who sits back and says, well, this stinks and this is wrong and so forth, but can't build or can't make or can't do. Or won't. I believe that's what that's talking about. Good question. Who else has a question like that? Have you, have you ever come across uh, a reviler that called himself a brother? Have you? I have not come across a reviler that's called himself a brother, no. Okay. I think they would have had a lot more problems back then. Okay. Because you have, you have to remember what the church was then. Uh, today we have all kinds of clubs and we have all kinds of social gatherings where people of different economic backgrounds can mix. <laughs> They had nothing like that at the time. It's one of the reasons why the church was such a phenomenon for them. Well, who, who's this landowner talking to a slave? Landowners don't talk to slaves. We don't, we don't mix like that. Suddenly in the church, they, they did have that. And there were all kinds of different people trying to force their way into this new social gathering. Not, not so much today. Not as much. So, so it seems like uh, there's a couple, two reactions that you get when you <clears throat> judge somebody inside the church. <clears throat> they can either be repentive or they can <laughs> tell you that you're wrong and how dare you do this or that's you know, misinterpretation or you, know, you can't judge me or whatever. How, how do you deal with that reaction of, how do you deal with that reaction, the second reaction? Yeah, the second reaction is, is bothersome in this sense. You, you hope that you can talk about the substance of what it is. But most of the time in our churches today, we never even get there. We begin with the moral authority of the person bringing it up. How dare you? Uh, this is just between me and God. You, you know. and, and so what we do is we question the standing of another person to even question anything. And most of the time, in my experience, Tim, we never even get past that. So until we can get past that and talk, talk about the actual substance, and really, it's 1 Corinthians is the place to do this because later on we're going to talk about some difficult things. Head coverings for women, for example. Um, you know, some people have, have dealt with that by saying, hey, you know, uh, 
we, we, we just aren't going to talk about that. Well, the Bible does speak to it. It doesn't speak to it on every page, but it does. Um, women speaking in the church, for example, the extent to which it's supposed to be silent. One person says, hey, you know, this is, you're, you're sinning if you do this. Another person says, no, I'm not. Well, hopefully you can talk about the substance if you're going to get in that discussion of what the Bible actually says, rather than, oh, no, you just brought this up and you're not allowed to talk about that. I don't know if, it, you know, I, I'd be interested in a show of hands. If you've ever tried to talk with another brother about something you believe is sinful in their lives, have you really ever been able to get past the who are you to judge stage? Have you ever been able to really do it? It's, it's been able to. One time. Out of how many? Several. Uh, se uh, several attempts. Yeah, I mean, it's, we, we, need to, we need to get there. So how do you get there? So how, so how do you, <laughs> How do you get there? Thanks. Thanks, Pastor. We, we need to get there. Okay. How, how do we do it? You know, um, will we? Yeah, will we? You know, as, as I was preparing this message, I was, I was thinking about something. And I didn't, didn't spend a whole lot of time on it. Well, any time on it today. I thought it was just a little bit maybe off the track. But there's an off... We, we've all had issues probably in our lives with what we call authoritarian churches. Where somebody at the top is just like controlling everything. Now what's wrong with that? Well, I, as a pastor, I don't have any, uh, any other authority than, than moral authority. I, I don't have the authority to externally control anyone here. <coughs> That's the job of the state, right? <laughs> the state's all about external controls. In the church, it's about moral authority within. And all we can do, all I can do as a pastor, is appeal to that moral authority. And every time I stand up and preach, every time, I hope, I hope and pray by God's grace that, I, that I'm always appealing to the moral authority of, of God. And his word. And the only way we get to that point, it seems to me, is that we all develop a great fear of God. That if someone brings something to us that we fear God and his word so much, and we don't really care who brought it to us. That's, that's irrelevant. What is relevant is what it actually says that we need to look at. Sounds like Job, right? Job, Job was like, yeah. He feared God so much that that's why. Sure he did. He did fear God. And he, and he did serve his neighbor because he feared God. I, I feel like there's a lot more that could be answered. I feel like he even had 35% answer that question. 35% is all I got. Or all I have right now. Who else has a question? <coughs> Tough subject. Okay. Okay, let, right here. We'll follow up and then come back. Because that... As I sit here and think, the only reason that that one woman heard me was not because of me, but that day it was I challenged someone on letting their yes be yes and their no no, and so she made a list of reasons that day why she did what she did. Five years later, she came back to me and said that was the best thing anybody ever did for me was to point that out to me. I did it consistently, so God convicted her. So. Uh, you know, unless somebody's godly and praying, she went home and said, God, if that's true, show me. And he did. So some of that's going to depend on the godliness of the person you're confronting. Yeah, we, we, we all need to be really careful here because if, if we if we are saying, who are you to bring this up to me and who are you and you're nobody and I'm somebody and may we at that point maybe have a little problem with an idol or a big problem with an idol of ourselves? That, that moment, no one tells me. Well, if no one tells me, guess, guess who's in charge of everything? <coughs> There's an idle problem going on here. Yes? Well, concerning that, the past two weeks, Liz has been dealing with that with people. There's two women that say they're believers, but they, they're conflicted. They, especially with abolition, that's what she was talking about with them. They say that they're 
they want they're abolitionists, but they want to take Christ out of it. And uh, when Liz was confronting him about it, they said, "Well, like, why are you judging me?" kind of thing. And she's been trying to, um, I guess, I don't know what the word is, but t talking to him that they need to repent of of this. And the one girl said that I just whatever the spirit leads me, that's what I'll do, kind of thing. And how how do I? encourage Liz to, and what point does Liz say, okay, I'm just going to dust my, my sandals up? Yeah, and, and, and there is a time, obviously, to do that, to say, I'm not going to, I'm not going to waste my time here anymore. Uh, by the way, let me just get back to something we said last week. Last week we talked about pearls before swine, or three weeks ago, three weeks ago. Pearls before swine and um, giving what is holy to the dogs. And I did do some study on that this, this past, well, especially this past week. Um, there comes a time when you when you just can't when you just can't talk anymore. Um, we know that the, that happened with the disciples in, in Acts, where Paul said we're just we're just not going to talk we're not talking to you anymore. We also know that Christ did that very same thing in Matthew chapter 12. I am from from here on in, or you're going to get this judgment. You're not going to get any more grace from me. It's going to be judgment, and I'm going to, and it's going to be judgment so bad that I'm going to require blood from you that you didn't even shed. But I can do that because I, because of what you've done here. I'm going to do it. That is, that is a, a critical point where we all have to come to, where you have to be able to say, you know what? At some point, I am going to stop talking. It's, it's a waste of time. It's a waste of energy. The, 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 the problem is for us all, Alan, is. <laughs> is, is to what extent do we fear God and His Word? And I want to be really careful what I'm about to say. It sounds really spiritual to say, why well, just do whatever the Spirit tells me? I don't know anybody that does whatever the Spirit tells me. I mean, you go to war of what the Bible says. Right? But I just do whatever the Spirit tells me? Wow. Who needs a Bible? Really? I just have the Spirit. You have to be, have to be really concerned with that kind of... Be, be concerned with that kind of language. Be very concerned. So I can kind of encourage this to just stop engaging, but they, they're the ones keeping, keeping the conversation going. Yeah, and in fact, I've been thinking about your situation as I studied this week, and I want to talk to you guys more about, about that, especially with your, with your family members. And hopefully we'll have time to do that today over fellowship, fellowship dinner. I want to talk more about that. Who else has a question or comment? Just a quick comment about being led by the Spirit, what the Spirit tells you, is that we hold the Spirit in our hand every week, every Sunday. The Spirit has, has provided us with the Bible. If the Spirit is leading you, then the Bible's leading you. If it's a voice in your head, if you can't find it in the Bible, you're you're very very thin ice. You're uh, listening to the voices in your head. And we all know about that, right? The voices in my head tell me. Yes, we have another question. Uh, that blog that you read at the beginning was that was that a, a pagan lady or supposed no. to be a Christian lady? That's a lady who was a whose husband was a. Uh, Church of Christ minister for 40 years. Is she still a Christian? Yeah, but is she still a Christian, or is she left a Christian because of No, she is not. She okay. still claims to be to be a Christian. I see. The Church of Christ denomination, you know, I'm not exactly sure where they are. I mean, they're, they're, they're baptismal regeneration people. You're not saved until you're baptized. So, I mean, I can't, I can't really speak to that issue so much. But what is, and I, I, I've been following this blog for quite a while. And again and again, it just comes up. This guy did some really funny stuff, but oh no, we can't say anything because we don't judge. All right, all right. And there's well, there's there's all kinds of blogs out there that say I'm not a Christian anymore because of my Christian upbringing, and so I just wasn't sure. Yeah, she's not a, she's not exactly in that in that particular category. Okay. But I hope by you know, my my purpose in, in of course sharing that is to show the damage that's done. In churches, because of our 
don't judge cultural ethic. And we did not get from the Bible, by the way. It definitely didn't come from there. Yes, sir? I think, in a way, it did because of Matthew 7. Because Matthew 7 is the one where Jesus says, I know in my own church experience, all these many, many, many years, you always hear, you know, take out the boat, you know, your brother's eye, you know, and then the demons your own eye. So it's like, you can't judge somebody else because you're already just as simple as they are in whatever way you might be, and you're, you're convicted of whatever's in your own life, and you just don't go there. And I think that's been a detriment to the church and to what you just preached this morning. Yeah, you know, one of the, the difficulty with Matthew 7, as I've studied it, is, is that we don't believe it enough. We, we, we don't take it to the end because, it's a, because the point of taking out the beam in your own eye is so that you can then see clearly to help it. And so what we've done is we've now grown comfortable with the beam in our own eye and the beam in my brother's eye. We're okay with that. Keep it in your eye, it's okay. You know, it's just too much work for me to get the one out of my own and then the one out of yours. And we're okay with it. And we call it spiritual. Not good. Do we have a question right now? Yeah. Can you tell, or have you told this congregation the story of your father who made a very simple stand against a leader of his church? Uh, when he would not shake his hand when he knew he was living in sin. Have I, have I mentioned that? that? It's very true. simple but powerful. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, one yeah. simple man doing okay. what he should have. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I will, I will share that. It's a good time for it. Thank you. Thank you, sweetheart. Um, I need two of these. <laughs> I don't need either one half the time. Um, Audrey um, just mentioned something that I, I thought I may have, may have shared in this congregation, but I apparently have not. I know we've talked about it. Um, when I was, um, I don't even know if I was born at the time. I don't think I was. Uh, my father was an elder in a, in a Bible church, Baptist church. And this is one of those stories that um, I've gone back to many times because it's given me great respect for my father. And um, that is a wonderful gift. Uh, one of the greatest gifts a father can give to the children is the ability to honor them and respect them. And this was one of those times. Uh, my father was an um, elder in a church. And um, one day the pastor called all the elders except one together. And so listen, we have a problem. The problem is... The elder that's not here, we'll call him Frank. No Frank's in here, other. Um, we'll call him Frank. Frank has come to me and confessed that he's in an adulterous situation. He's committing adultery. I've not told this to this congregation before. <coughs> All right. So, so what? So, um, but the pastor went on to say, "Don't tell anyone." Because he asked me not to tell anyone. So I'm, but I'm telling you, but they don't tell anybody. Okay? Okay, good. We won't tell anyone. Well, there was a problem, though, because the next time my father saw this man, my father refused to shake his hand. Yeah, he wasn't going to slap him on the back. How's wife? How's the kids? How's everything going? It's all good, right? Shake hands. It's okay. I have adultery going on. My father would shake his hand. What do you think happens next with the pastor? Who do you think is in trouble at this moment? Of course, my dad's in trouble, right? Let's see. Now, we have this guy here who's, who's, who's committing adultery, and we have this guy over here who won't shake the hand of the person who's committing adultery. Who are we going to take it out on? My father wound up pretty much getting chased out of the church, but not before there was a, a there was a confrontation. And this I love about my father, because there was a there was a, a meeting with all the elders, and this man who was in this adulterous situation said to the other elders in that church, "But I really love this woman." 
You know what dad said? He said, that's not love, that's lust. Well, if he was ever going to come back to the church before, he was going to come back after that one. <laughs> and um, what happened after that was, um, it's kind of a complicated thing, but um, my father um, put up with an awful lot because there was, there was connections between the church and where my dad worked. And a lot of people went to work where my dad worked, went to that church. And this pastor really hated my father. But he himself, um, years later, was caught in the act of adultery himself. It was an amazing story that happened. He um, denied it, even though he was caught. Fought everyone who brought it to his attention, tried to confront him, and died of some weird liver thing about three or four months afterwards. Just, I mean, just died. And um, my father was, was quite vindicated of the whole thing. But that was a case where, uh, I, you know, as I understand, a man just stood up, said and did the right thing, and paid for it pretty severely. Now, we, we like to think in the churches that if we stand up and do the right thing, that we're going to be rewarded for it. Most of the time, it doesn't happen that way too often. You know, it just, just really doesn't. But um, what a gift my father gave to me. A great example, too, of not even eating. Right. Not even, thank you. Yeah. Not even to eat. Not even to eat. Right. Not even shake his hand. Yeah. Not even. Right. No encouragement whatsoever. <clears throat> None. It is an example. Thank you. I wasn't thinking of it. Yes, we have another question. <coughs> um, could that also be a good uh, example of, of a beam and, and, a, and a spec? Um, a man has an adult, uh, adult relationship, and the other man doesn't. <coughs> Uh, I guess if there was ever an example of beam and spec, I guess that would be, uh, that would definitely qualify. Definitely. There, there is such a thing. Yeah. You see, we, we, we trivialize things like adultery because we say, well, all sin, why are you concentrating on, on adultery when all sins are the same? We trivialize it. But Paul did it in this passage. He concentrated on some things. Thank you for your kind attention here this morning.